The following program features archival footage from World War II. All of the images are real. Some are extremely graphic. Viewer discretion is advised. Burma, a dense tropical jungle landscape that in 1942 becomes a nightmare of guerrilla warfare, slave labor, and terrible brutality. The Japanese were absolutely ruthless. The only thing you could do was to kill them. In this film, we explore Japan's imperial ambitions as it hunts for natural resources in a bid to drive European colonialism out of Asia. Burma is so phenomenally quick Japanese victory stuns the British. They are mentally not prepared for this at all. Featuring newsreel at the time, the Japanese gaining rare and enhanced archive footage, and the testimonies of those who were there. We were guerrillas. We could hit a base, we could shoot them up, and we don't have to hold ground. We could disappear into the jungle. This is World War II, witness to war. Hawaii, December 1941. Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor has severely damaged the US Pacific Fleet. In Washington, D.C., President Franklin D. Roosevelt declares war on Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. In London, Prime Minister Winston Churchill is relieved to hear the news. For him, it's the best chance for victory. Britain is no longer alone in its fight against the Axis powers. But Adolf Hitler doesn't wait long to respond. On December the 11th, 1941, Nazi Germany declares war on the US in support of its ally, Japan. At this point in the war, Britain's resources have been stretched thin. The country has been battered during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. Now, the RAF is embroiled in a bombing campaign over Germany. In order to fuel its war effort, this island nation relies heavily on supplies from its colonies overseas. Modern industrial war really needs a lot of iron to make steel, a rubber to make tires, and oil to make it all go. The resource base for the British Empire to succeed in a war against Germany is in Southeast Asia. India, Burma, Ceylon, Malaya, Hong Kong, a string of islands in the Pacific. I mean, this really was you know, painted red on everybody's atlas. Um, and for the British, it was uh, very important economically in terms of trade and so on. British territories like Malaya and Singapore are essential. They are economically our uh, powerhouse of the British Empire. And of course, what we have developing on Singapore Island is a major military base. It is supposed to solve the problem of protecting a scattered empire in the east of Suez and particularly the Pacific region. In a Royal Air Force plane, we fly alongside the city and note its new civil airport circular in shape as we rise to higher altitudes. Down we come in our reconnaissance plane to spot HMS Eagle, aircraft carrier of the forces attacking Singapore, in a mock battle designed to test the defences of the port. British forces protect the colony as expats manage the extraction of its natural resources. For Malaya, three or four million acres of rubber produce a good two-thirds of the world's supply. Here, they're turning the coagulated rubber into crepe, which is hung up to dry before packing. For the British people living in the colonies, life is pleasant. The striking thing about life in uh, 
uh, Britain's imperial possessions, Hong Kong, Malaya. And there are quite interesting accounts, eyewitness accounts from this period, which say that, you know, people went on, you know, partying, going to cocktail bars, having dinners and playing golf and doing all the things they'd done as the imperial people for a very long period of time. While the writing was clearly on the wall, that, that they were in a very dangerous and exposed position. I didn't really know what to expect, but uh, when we got there, there was tennis and dances and, uh, and working, of course, so uh, time passed quite pleasantly. Well, you went to work all day, and then weekends, it was usually beach parties or dances. A half a million. A native worker travels by motor bus for the climate is very like a hot house, and nobody does much walking. Teeming with representatives of every race in the world, it is largely policed by Sikhs. A possum is here seen marching to duty over a bridge near the big European shops, clubs and offices. British colonies of Hong Kong and Malaya at the time, it's a real mix of different races. It's important to remember that these are colonial possessions, so they are ruled ultimately by uh, British people. But within there, we do have plenty of points of indigenous power. We have uh, Malayan sultans, for instance. We have very, very affluent Chinese merchants in Singapore, and of course, in all of these places, a, a very, very privileged um, white commercial, political and military class. It was a wonderful life. Uh, my brother and I used to go to school in a sedan chair. We were about a mile away from the school. And it, it was a very privileged life. It, it, it was great fun in Hong Kong. Tokyo, 1940. Prior to the Pearl Harbor attack, Emperor Hirohito and his military generals had a plan in place to expand the Japanese Empire. They know it's crucial to secure the resources which will enable it to continue waging war with China and to take on the US and its allies. Their target, the British colonies of Southeast Asia. The British had some intelligence about Japanese in, intentions, but, but I think that they couldn't imagine in geographical terms or in military terms that the Japanese really would try to occupy or attack the, you know, the whole area of the Pacific and, and uh, Southeast Asia because they were bogged down with a major war in China. When the British Army and the Royal Navy looked at the possibility of being attacked by the Japanese, they took a view that was profoundly, wrongly, horribly racist. The British Army could not accept that Japanese people could make good soldiers. We refused to believe that people we had always thought of as racially inferior could possibly beat us in a fight because the British Empire assumed that Japanese people were racially inferior to British people, the British Empire was underprepared for the reality that a very capable, professional, ruthless army was about to attack them. As a precaution in the spring of 1941, the British make an attempt to prepare for a Japanese attack. The threat of war in the east had long been menacing the Malay Peninsula when these pictures were made. The latest illustrations of some of the steps taken to meet the threat. Coastal defense works were being extended to every beach where a landing might be attempted. China was already at war with Japan, and we had a funny feeling that the Japanese would sooner or later calm down. We watched the build-up for war as thousands of soldiers flooded in from Britain, Australia, and India. The newspapers assured everyone that all this show of force would make Japan hesitate before attacking Fortress Singapore. Still, the preparations will prove to be too little, too late, and no match for the Japanese on a mission. Tokyo, December 1941. With war raging in Europe, 
the Japanese Empire sets its sights on capturing much-needed resources in the Dutch, French and British colonies of Southeast Asia. Within hours of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japanese troops invade the Philippines, the Dutch East Indies and the British peninsula of Malaya. A Japanese airstrike is unleashed on Singapore. Simultaneously, Imperial Japanese forces descend on the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. We went out, this fellow had a car, I think there were five or six of us. We all clambered in this car. We saw these soldiers coming down, filing down either side of the road. We waved to them, carried on. We decided to climb to the top of this hill. And when we got to the top, we thought, well, that's funny, what's happening down there? All the ships were going out of Limoon Pass, and we just could not understand what it was all about. And it wasn't until the next morning when they bombed Stanley that we knew what it was about. The Battle of Hong Kong is now underway as battle-hardened Japanese troops advance on unprepared British colonial forces. They bomb Britain's airfields to end all hope of air defence. First few days, it just got continual bombing because we haven't got any air force. And the Japanese planes come over at ease. And also, we got a bombing from the battleship outside. And we were all sitting around against the wall. And then we saw the ceiling fall in. And then another bomb came in. Luckily, it didn't explode. And that is why I'm still here. Meanwhile, to the southwest in the jungles of Malaya, the Japanese army squares off against British colonial forces. All the early reports from Malaya spoke of heavy and confused fighting with the Japanese gaining ground. Among troops defending the land are Gurkhas, who were soon in action. Hardened by their battles in China, the Japanese are formidable opponents. I think the reason that the Japanese were so successful in this Far East campaign, we thought they would attack in certain directions. They didn't. They didn't come in from the sea. They came overland down Malaya, marching and on bicycles. And they cycled their way through the rubber plantations. Their way of life was such that they didn't need some of the uh, rations, and that sort of thing that we did. They weren't tied to using motor transport, uh, which at the, that stage we were, and they were fanatical. One of the advances that the Japanese have is they're coming from the landward. In the Hong Kong case, they are coming from mainland China, using tactics that encircle, outmaneuver the uh, British Imperial forces every single step of the way. Hong Kong, Christmas Day, 1941. Japanese shells rain down on the island, forcing the British to surrender. We are the orders to destroy all the guns, destroy the lorries. The men, now we just had to wander down with white camouflage nets and things, with mosquito nets that we had to surrender. And we waited there for orders of where we to proceed to by the Japanese. The battle for Hong Kong's over, but for soldier and civilian alike, the worst is still to come. For the British and other Europeans living in Southeast Asia, the arrival of the Japanese really was a shock, and the Japanese were determined from the outset to make it clear that this was an Asian race triumphing over the, the Caucasian race. 
in Hong Kong, for example, they, they took a whole lot of the Hong Kong British colonists and they marched this rather bedraggled column through the city to show the Chinese that, you know, here are your lords and masters, now look at them. Rampaging Japanese troops stormed the British Field Hospital at St. Stephen's College. Doctors, nurses and patients are tortured and killed. That was a military hospital and they bayoneted every patient in those beds that couldn't move and two of the nurses. Let's say they were not nice people, they were... They treated you like a... Oh, I don't know, like a, an animal. With the fall of Hong Kong, Japan's army in Malaya pushes the British colonial forces into retreat. All remaining British soldiers are gathered on Singapore Island. But the so-called British stronghold is not ready for an attack. We were told that Singapore was a fortress, but when we got there, we found out that it wasn't. The guns were the main naval guns to protect Singapore Harbour and whatever were facing the wrong wave to cover the landing from the uh, Malay from the Malaysia end. No airplanes, no air force cover. Singapore was a half-built garage. If you can imagine, it's almost like having the most uh, fantastic garage you can have, fit for a Rolls Royce. But you then actually don't purchase the Rolls Royce. So you develop the world's foremost naval facility, but you don't build a fleet to reside within it. Of course, the problem here, and again, we can't uh, um, mock commanders at the time, is that the British are facing too many enemies at once. We had to stop the Germans, no matter what happened. We had to stop the invasion of England, which meant that every tank, gun, everything they could find had to go into the Europe campaign, with the result that the Far East was sort of put on the back burner and we were short of supplies. And that was the reason that the Japanese just walked by Douglas. On February the 8th, 1942, Japanese forces attack Singapore. First a heavy bombardment, then troops on the ground who are met with little resistance. On February the 15th, the Allied troops defending the island surrender to the Japanese. My war was over in four weeks, and the whole thing was horrible. When we surrendered, uh, we were paraded along one of the main roads leading into Singapore. The Japanese general came down a big cavalcade of cars and troops and whatever, and uh, simply stood up in the car and looked around at, you know, the people we conquered, and they, they were gloating and uh, really showing their superiority, which they had every right to do so. They beat us, thoroughly. With the fall of Singapore and Malaya, the region is now ruled by a new master. The British are shocked by the lack of, if you like, support and understanding from amongst the indigenous populations of their Asian colonies when the Japanese crash into them and take them over. And it leads to a, a period of soul searching within British imperialism about why they haven't managed to gain the loyalty of their colonial subjects. And many of the colonial subjects would probably say it's because we've been treated as colonial subjects for a long time. Unfortunately for the peoples of these countries, they're about to find out, most of them anyway, that the Japanese are far worse imperial masters. London, 1942. Prime Minister Winston Churchill takes stock of the position and has every reason for concern. Japan is determined to liberate all of Asia from the oppression of European colonialism. The next step is obvious. All eyes turn to Burma. Burma is rich in oil, which is a vital need for Japan's war effort. It is also one step closer to India. Burma was part of the British Empire in those days, and that was their easiest route to India. They wanted India the jewel in the British crown, and therefore we had to defend Burma as best we could. However, Burma isn't only a pathway to India. Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek is supported by the US in his battle against the Japanese. 
Chiang Kai-shek himself flew to Latio with his wife. He has done more than any living man to weld the Chinese into one nation to resist Japan. He's a, a fascinating character because he's both uh, a military man, he's Christian, he's a Confucian, and he's an opportunist. Uh, more importantly, however, is that his wife speaks very good English. He goes to uh, America, he's, he's on the cover of Time magazine, and he wins over, or they win over, the American public, and they win over uh, Americans who are looking to support their efforts against Japanese machinations in Northeast Asia. The American supply route to the Chinese nationalists runs directly through Burma. Known as the Burma Road, it's a vital artery the US can't afford to lose. The Japanese Empire has got to attack into Burma to stop the flow of supplies from India into the American-supported Chinese forces fighting the Japanese. On December the 11th, 1941, the Japanese invasion of Burma begins. After assaulting British airfields, ground troops quickly follow, crossing the border from Siam, modern-day Thailand. Once again, the underprepared British forces are quickly overwhelmed. Burma is so phenomenally quick Japanese victory in Southeast Asia stuns the British. They are mentally not prepared for this at all. For the British, the defense of Burma did rely on the development of the Indian Army. The problem there, of course, was that Indian troops uh, had been formed quite late. Uh, it took time to get the Indian Army uh, organized. It took a great deal of time to actually arm uh, Indian units. Uh, and when the Japanese attacked Burma, there were almost no combat aircraft, almost no tanks in India. So there really was no alternative in the end but to fall back on India and hope the Japanese would stop there. As British colonial forces flee, they adopt a scorched earth policy. Of the total wealth of Burma, the most important item was the oil. Any and all of the machinery that drew oil from the earth was therefore smashed in a systematic orgy of destruction. Bridges have been blown up, factories and stations destroyed, and much damage done to add to the destruction wrought by the enemy himself. Japan's army reaches Burma's capital, Rangoon. I remember the war breaking out, and at the time, it seemed rather exciting. <laughs> it's an awful thing to say, but I think when you're young, it's, um, you know, something, el something else is going to happen, you know, because the Japs were there in Rangoon, and we were evacuated by road in a road convoy. Um, I think we were allowed one suitcase each, and I remember my mother filled her suitcase with photographs of the family, photographs in silver frames, nothing else. Civilians and allied forces retreat north into the dense Burmese jungle. The rapidly advancing Japanese troops seem unstoppable. Their guerrilla tactics are perfect for the thick jungle terrain, and they quickly gain the upper hand. The Japanese. They pull a little dog as he's walking, mm -hmm. so they don't have no weight, you know. All they carry is a bag of, of rice. They have parboiled rice, which is just a sling off their shoulder, mm -hmm. and along with that dog, you know, mm -hmm. they can live for months. We weren't trained for jungle fighting. It was out of our uh, orbit, if you like, that uh, we were just not ready for it. Following the absence of news from the Burma front, Grave news of further Japanese success has now been announced. British, Indian, and Burmese troops were resisting here, fighting a rearguard action against heavy odds. The Japanese forces in the Chinese war, they'd become increasingly brutalized in the conflict. Atrocity there became routine. So when they found themselves confronting Europeans, they didn't really change their habits very much. Partly because they've been brought up to now to dislike Europeans, to think of Europeans as, as if you like, the white peril. Well, one thing was quite clear. They were fanatics. They were mad. I mean, they were just fiendish. They would scream and shout and charge and be killed. And then another lot would just come over. They really had no fear, whereas I suppose that we do have some fear. They would fight to the last man, and then that last man would commit Harry Carey. The Japanese themselves were, were absolutely ruthless. The only thing you could do was to kill them. 
May 1942, soldiers fighting in the jungle face a new enemy. This is the China-Burma-India theater, a land of high mountains and at times one of the wettest places on Earth. Rainfall in this country can make a stream rise a foot in a few hours, make a lake out of a valley, or slide a mountainside down on a road. The monsoon season makes it almost impossible to fight. Burma is a place with very thick jungle, very poor roads, and very rough terrain. Roads in Burma cease to exist for half the year when the monsoon comes. When the monsoon comes in Burma, it's not like it's raining. It's like somebody is dumping a giant bucket of water onto your head all the time. The monsoons were just like sheets of water coming down on top of you. I've never seen anything like it in my life. We hadn't got the right sort of kit, you see. Most of our, our equipment was the old-fashioned canvas webbing. And of course, once that got wet, it was um, hopelessly wet. <laughs> and stayed wet and got heavier, apart from anything else. In these harsh conditions, the health of troops on both sides rapidly deteriorates. Rain from middle of May until the end of September, continuously, day and night, with strong rain, and loaded with the mud, Japanese army never operated properly in Burma. Uh, decently, everybody decent, and the malaria. And Japanese army never supplied any medicine for, for malaria. Never, never I, I was supplied. As Burma takes its toll on the troops, one thing becomes clear. The jungle takes no prisoners. Burma, 1943. The Japanese army completely dominates the British colony. As well as wreaking havoc on the Allies, they've cut off America's supply route to China, the Burma Road, forcing the US to supply Chiang Kai-shek by air at great risk. Losing the Burma Road meant that American aircraft have got to fly over the hump over a spur of the Himalayas. Very difficult to do with the propeller aircraft of the time in order to resupply the Chinese in dribs and drabs. To gain the upper hand, Japan is working on its own supply infrastructure in the form of a railroad. What the Japanese are facing is increasingly their ability to use sea lines of communication as being eroded by allied action against their merchant marine and also their main uh, warships. So the Burma-Thailand railway that's going to connect Bangkok with Burma becomes all important so that you can resupply these Japanese forces operating at the extreme limits of a chain of supply, but also so that you can begin to shift non-military resources that are deemed essential. And the human costs in this and other major Japanese uh, infrastructural and engineering developments is absolutely huge. Going to the jungle and build a railroad, that was the only specific order we got in Burma. The jungle was incredible. It was deep, dark, and dense, with giant trees like you wouldn't believe. The Burma Siam Railway was to be 400 kilometers long. Japan is prepared to use any means necessary to ensure the supply of its forces. The Japanese army saw no problem at all with taking prisoners of war taken in Singapore and elsewhere and having them build military railways. I didn't really know anything about the Geneva Convention except that something like it existed. For us Japanese, becoming a prisoner was itself the greatest shame imaginable. It was the same as death. What goes through the mind of the soldier who is taken prisoner of war. You feel as if you'd let yourself down, your family, and your country. We would um, wake up before dawn, get the tools, proceed to the railway site where you're working. You would cut out chunks of earth, put onto the, um, onto the stretcher, 
and carry it to the, to the site. And you dump that, you go back, you do it again, time after time, time after time, time after time. The sheer uh, repetition of carrying this load, I think, was the main thing that caused those people to die on the railway. I felt genuinely sorry for the captives, but I was in no position to actively improve their conditions. In fact, it wasn't even supposed to be of concern to me what the conditions were in the prison camps. The Japanese army pursues the construction of the railroad at any cost, pushing their prisoners to the limits. They would beat you, beat you with a pickaxe, piece of bamboo, they would beat you and you stand there and be beaten. If you moved, they beat you more. I was beaten once badly because I tried to smuggle some stuff into the camp. Had to stand to attention in hot sun for a couple of days. POWs receive almost no medical attention and food is scarce. Every day we were losing weight. I went down to six stone, other people went down to five. I was like a walking skeleton because I was thin to start with anyway. And as soon as you did get sick of anything, you would die. To survive is up to you entirely, completely. You did what you could to keep yourself alive. If you haven't got the willpower, then you don't survive. And many, many people just died because they wanted to. They couldn't stand it anymore. During the war, I'd lost my tag, so I had one made. I had this thing round my neck, and every night before I went to sleep, I kiss this. And I always say good night to my wife. A most remarkable thing to do, but it worked. It kept me alive. As the railroad work advances, Japan seems to be securing its position. If Britain and its allies hope to push back against Japan, they need new tactics. The British Army has always had a lot of room at its fringes for slightly mad, brilliant officers. When the Indian Army needed people to apply irregular warfare methods against the Japanese in Burma, that lunatic Bible-thumping maniac, Ord Wingate, suddenly became the ideal person to uh, conduct irregular operations independent of close supervision against the Japanese. Ord Wingate creates a long-range jungle penetration unit, the Chindits. These special operations units become a key new weapon in Britain's jungle war. Our job was to tear up the railway lines and to blow up the bridges. Ambush them, generally make a nuisance of ourselves and hopefully divert as many uh, of the Japanese fighting formations as possible. We were lightly armed. We hadn't got field guns and tanks or anything like that. We had mules with machine guns on them and only two in every column. They came in gliders, but were armed with heavy machine guns and mortars. Overhead warplanes patrolled to protect them. The rail line was cut off near Maluwu. We were given the order, advance. All we had were our own rifles and maybe two or three hand grenades. Heavy machine gun bullets flew by just above our heads. Then, bam, 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 trench mortar explosion came towards us. We were just 100 railroad soldiers crawling across rice field, armed with only single-shot rifles. Recognizing the success of the Chindits, the US creates its own special team to operate behind enemy lines under the command of Frank Dow Merrill. Our unit was divided into three battalions, the entire 5307, which was nicknamed Merrill's Marauders by the press. We were guerrillas. We could hit a base, we could shoot them up, and we don't have to hold ground. We can disappear into the jungle. There were no roads. Northern Burma was primitive. And the people that lived there were very nice. I mean, it was fine, but they were, they were primitive. 
arduous, I suppose, is the word. It had a lot of weight on our backs. And of course, it was all mud and slippery, and the mules, and often we had to offload them and hump the loads up the hill and then get them up and load them up again. There were times where we carried men that were seriously injured on litters for miles because we had to find a rice paddy level enough for a Piper Cub to land on, which was the only way of getting out by plane. Merrill's marauders operate in remote areas behind enemy lines, making them difficult to supply. We'd do drops to the chindits who were behind the enemy lines. Uh, we were usually told what they were short of. It might be petrol, it could be ammunition, uh, it could be shells, it could be food. Whatever we were asked to drop, we would drop it. We found sometimes that if you had a big crate to push out, that it would need two or three chaps to help, and they would push. And on what, several occasions at the beginning of these drops, um, a person would lose his footing. And we lost several because they pushed so hard, they went with the gear. We lost several, and unfortunately, not only through gunfire, but from disease. Malaria, typhus, dysentery, uh, was rampant there. And we survived practically the whole time on rations. Special operations work wonders for morale, but Japan still dominates the jungles of Burma. Tokyo, spring 1944. Japanese high command considers its next move. Still searching for resource-rich territories, the empire looks west. It sets its sights on British India. Japan hopes that it can win the support of the Indian people. The Japanese had started uh, the Indian National Army. Right? They're, they're, the whole idea behind empire is liberation of Asia, Asia for the Asiatics. The Indians working for the Japanese told the Japanese that all they needed to do was have a good kick at the British in India and there would be a great uprising and the British would be thrown out and a new independent Japanese controlled puppet India would emerge. Japan targets Impal and Kohima. Its goal is to gain its first foothold in India. But moving this far west poses a problem for Japan's supply chains. When the Japanese attack into northeastern India, they are at the ragged edge of their logistics. They can barely supply their forces operating in northeastern India. The Japanese wanted India and we were not going to let them have it. There was a, a siege there for about 15 days when about 1,500 men of the Royal West Kent Regiment defended that little town against 30,000 Japanese. The turning point of the Burma War took place at the Battle of Kohima. Unlike Japan, Britain is able to supply its troops on the ground. The British Army is able to fight and win by massive resupply from the air. Kohima's built on six hills, and it was a bit difficult there dropping exactly on a particular spot because you would come in low at about 200 feet and suddenly find a hill of about 800 feet ahead of you, and you had to zoom up over the top of it and probably go around again and try and do it again. We did lose about seven Dakotas, if I remember rightly, during that siege, where they did run into the hills, which was tough. British and Allied forces strike back, forcing the Japanese into retreat. The mass uprising of the Indian people doesn't happen. Japan's attempt to dismantle Britain's rule of India is failing. Perhaps if the Japanese were launching an invasion in 1942, um, they could have experienced some success. But by that point, the empire's resources were stretched so thin and they had so little air support, so little supplies, and very few 
uh, 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 experienced uh, uh, military units that the invasion was, was something of a catastrophe for them. Our infantry and tanks, after heavy and difficult fighting, succeeded in driving back the enemy and reopening the roads. So confident were the Japs of winning the Battle of Impal that they gave a positive date for its capture, March the 17th. But they hadn't taken it yet. In fact, they've been put into reverse, losing heavily in the process, and their casualties have been mounting every day. India, summer 1944. Having stopped the Japanese in their tracks, Britain and its allies are now ready to take the fight to Japan. It was jungle fighting, a form of battle at which the Japs once thought they had it all their own way. But the men of the 14th have long since taken their measure. Formed in 1943, Britain's 14th Army consists of British, Indian and Commonwealth troops. Their combined battle skills and experience make them formidable opponents. The British Army is able to come roaring back and defeat the Japanese because Japan is unable to sustain its war effort at exactly the moment when the British are able to put an immense amount of combat power, air power, and training at the disposal of the best general the British Army has ever produced, William Slim. Our picture shows Harry bombers setting out to destroy a group of 50 or 60 Japs in a nearby village. As commander of the Burma Corps, Major General William Slim is able to turn the tables on Imperial Japan, forcing it into retreat. As an army, they were unbeatable at the beginning. We just couldn't stop them. We haven't got the stuff to stop them. But eventually, when we were reorganized and had the equipment, then they didn't stand up to us. And uh, much as they thought they could, I'm afraid we uh, showed them the other side of the sword. The Japanese Empire almost expands to three quarters of the size of the British Empire, but in a fraction of the time. It is an empire, but it, it is an empire that kind of expanded so quickly that it didn't necessarily have a rhyme or reason. Because Japanese soldiers had believed that holding on to places like Burma were integral for the defense of the home islands and their families, they were utterly committed to making these projects go forward successfully. But even with all of that mental and spiritual commitment, it simply didn't work. The war against Japan is going well. Our American allies in the Pacific have won great victories. And we have had our own successes in liberating the greater part of Burma. But the Japanese is a tough enemy and much must be done before he will admit defeat. As conflict rages across the globe, the Axis powers of World War II all have one goal in mind. From Japan's designs on Asia to Hitler's ambitions in Europe and Mussolini's plans for North Africa, it all comes down to empire. <laughs> 